overhead and a little damp underfoot, but these are perfect conditions in central London as we welcome you to Horse Guards Parade, where the crowds are ready for a hugely significant historic event that dates back more than two centuries. This is Trooping the Colour as we mark the King's official birthday. All five regiments of the Foot Guards making their way onto centre stage led by the statuesque figure of Turlock Moore, the Irish wolfhound known as Seamus, the regimental mascot of the Irish Guards. Because this year, it is number nine company Irish Guards who have the honor of providing the escort and trooping their color. And with them comes the musical flair of the pipes and drums. We have a real treat in store. His Majesty the King will set off from Buckingham Palace for his second birthday parade as monarch. And he will be accompanied by other members of the royal family. There is huge excitement around that. Events will conclude after the ceremony of Trooping the Colour with the much anticipated royal balcony appearance ahead of the spectacular Royal Air Force fly past. The red tunics and bearskins of the Foot Guard regiments are synonymous with these great national occasions, but away from ceremonial duty, these are frontline soldiers. Let's find out just how to prepare a birthday parade fit for a king, and indeed, what makes the Irish Guards so distinct. So this is Seamus. Um, he is four years old. Seamus is very important to the regiment. Basically, he represents the Irish Guards when we're on ceremonial duties. He's very popular among the troops. As soon as they see him on parade, it brings a big smile to everybody. The Irish Guards is unique with a great mix from north, south of Ireland, Liverpool, Birmingham, London, and then with a wide variety of people from all over the Commonwealth. Once you're in the Irish Guards, we all are part of the family. I'm from Fiji. I'm very excited for tripping the colour. Uh, it's an honour and privilege to represent the Irish Guards. We all look out for each other. You think someone's feeling a wee bit effy, you give them a wee bit of encouragement. Every regiment's different, and everyone has their own pride. Obviously, we're the Irish Guards, and we've got that little bit of extra swagger. <laughs> it's long hours, the mornings all the way to the evenings. Eight weeks of hard work on the drill square, six hours a day. It is extremely taxing on the body. The position on the day is a non-negotiable. We really need to be the sharpest and the best that we can be. Within the ranks, we have some uh, troops that it's the first King's Birthday Parade. And for them to come on this journey with us is a proud moment for them. I'm 18 years old, so I'm uh, the youngest on the escort to the colour this year. Your arms do get like, quite heavy after a few hours, but it'll be really special for me to march past the King. My first trip, I was a guardsman in the ranks. I remember it clearly going round the square for six weeks, so I know the pain the troops are going through. When the lads put on the tunic, chest pumped out, they'll grow six inches. For the young Irish guardsman to troop the colour, should be one of his proudest moments of being in the regiment, especially when he marches past his Majesty the King and gives that eyes right. Die! And on the day, in typical Irish Guards tradition, it will be a perfect parade. Such a good insight there to the Irish Guards and to the personalities of some of those on parade. For the second year running, all five regiments of the Foot Guards are represented here on parade. Number nine company Irish Guards with their distinctive plumes of St. Patrick's Blue are providing number one guard known as the Escort. And they are led by captain of the Escort, Major Brookie Trant. Number two guard is provided by Nijmegen Company Grenadier Guards. F Company Scots Guards make up number three guard. Number four and five guards are comprised of 1st Battalion Welsh Guards, easily spotted by the green and white plumes representing a leek. And at the far end, number seven company Coldstream Guards provide number six guard. 
and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by a special guest, someone who served with the Irish Guards for more than 30 years and indeed was their commanding officer, Major General Sir Christopher Geeko. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Claire. Great to be with you. And you are uniquely positioned to give an insight into the regiment and indeed the events of today. Well, it's a diff slightly different perspective for me, but I think I join with a lot of Irish Guardsmen all over the world in looking forward to a really great parade this morning. And until 2023, you held the post of Major General Commanding Household Division. Um, I did, but my viewpoint might have changed, but some things about this parade don't change, and that's the hard work, the professionalism and the teamwork required to deliver a first-rate performance. Now, it's already been a big week for the Irish Guards, Number 9 Company in particular. A big moment for Number 9 Company was special resonance, as on, Winds, on Monday at Windsor, the King presented the company with new colours, which they're trooping today. Well, there are more than a 1,000 troops ready on Horse Guards Parade, and the man in charge of them today, the commanding officer of London Central Garrison, Lieutenant Colonel James Colby. And there he is. And meanwhile, down at Buckingham Palace, we await the departure of the first carriages carrying members of the royal family. see there the sovereign's escort comprising the two regiments of the household cavalry the lifeguards in the foreground there and the blues and royals and they're formed up waiting to accompany the king to his birthday parade Now, because of the weather, and it was raining quite heavily about half an hour ago, the cover is up on the carriage. But I promise you, there in Lemon is the Duchess of Edinburgh alongside the Duke of Kent. And Lady Louise Windsor is the one braving the elements, wearing blue. And... In the carriage behind, we have the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence, whose wife, the Princess Royal, will be riding on parade. Huge crowds gathered right along the Mall and indeed here on Horse Guards. And the Duchess of Edinburgh's husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Edward, took over the colonelcy of the Scots Guards from the Duke of Kent just a few months ago. The Duke of Kent had served in that role for 50 years. As this procession heads for Horse Guards Parade, all eyes return to Buckingham Palace as His Majesty the King prepares to depart for his second birthday parade as monarch. His Majesty the King and Her Majesty the Queen in the Scottish state coach. And in the second carriage there, the wonderful and welcome sight of Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales, along with Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. It is the first time we've seen the Princess of Wales in public this year. And a sign of how important this day is to the royal family. And as Colonel of the Irish Guards, sign of how strongly the Princess of Wales felt about being here for them, because it will mean a lot to them, Chris. Uh, absolutely. All Irish Guardsmen were hugely proud when the King appointed the Princess of Wales to be our Colonel in 2023, and it's just brilliant to see her out 
uh, watching her own regiment this morning. It'll be a massive tonic and a lift to everybody on parade. The king and queen in this glorious carriage, which obviously very suitable for the weather and glass sided so that the crowds can see them. And for King Charles III, his second birthday parade as monarch, he first attended Trooping the Colour as a two-year-old in 1951. So he's watched on or taken part in this parade for more than 70 years. And you can hear the cheering from the crowds. Today he'll take his place on horse guards as Colonel-in-Chief of all seven regiments of the Household Division on parade today. Up on Horse Guards Parade, number three guard has opened up to make way for the first carriage procession as they pass under the 56 flags of the Commonwealth Nations. They will make their way to the Major General's office from where they will observe the parade. But look at this for a sight. That really is magnificent, isn't it? And leading them is the Brigade Major of the Household Division, Lieutenant Colonel James Shaw of the Grenadier Guards, flanked by four troopers of the Life Guards and Blues and Royals, and they've been chosen from the regiment's smartest turned out troopers. They are followed by the mounted band of the Household Cavalry and the first and second divisions of the Sovereign's Escort. And the tradition of appointing the Household Cavalry to escort the Sovereign up to Horse Guards Parade was introduced by the King's grandfather, King George VI, in 1937. we can see there the king is wearing the tunic of the guard of honor order the irish guards the sovereign wears the uniform of whichever regiment's color is being trooped now this is lieutenant colonel shaw's third and final birthday parade in this role it's a tenure that has been remarkably busy it has seen him lead the processions for the platinum jubilee the funeral of the late Queen and the coronation of His Majesty the King. And we caught up with him ahead of the day's events. So my primary role is to ensure that the King arrives exactly on time at 11 o'clock at Horse Guards. Um, high pressure role, but uh, a really exciting role at the same time. Leading the Royal Procession, you ride down the Mall. The Mall is stretched out in front of you. Admiralty Arches at the end, and you are hit by all the flags flying, the sea of colour, and then the noise of the crowd clapping and cheering the entire way. It's the most amazing experience and one I wish I could bottle and share with everyone. I am sad it's my last one. I will miss these huge special days, but it has been a remarkable experience and I'm hugely grateful for it. And the King will be delighted to be able to share this with such a large, large gathering. And also, it is all about the connection, isn't it, between the Sovereign and his troops? Absolutely. The relationship between the Colonel-in-Chief and his household troops is far more than symbolism. He takes a huge interest, and away from the pomp of days like this, he pays really highly valued visits to regiments to meet soldiers and their families. He's viewed as an integral part of every regiment, and that's why it's such a proud moment for all Irish Guardsmen to see him wearing his Irish Guards uniform on the way to the birthday parade this morning. And there we have a closer look at the Royal Colonels and the Princess Royal on the right there. As I mentioned earlier, a really experienced equestrian, European Open champion in eventing, and not easy, you know, to ride on parade in uniform for anyone. And obviously we have an awful lot of people riding today, but the Princess Royal, as I mentioned, in the uniform of the Blues and Royals, Duke of Edinburgh was there and the Prince of Wales as well. But there we get a good shot of the younger Royals, Prince Louis waving back to the crowds and Prince Louis now six years old. 
a real character. Lifeguards making their way around that final turn beneath the flags of the Commonwealth nations. And just a word on the Princess of Wales and the fact that she is Colonel of the Irish Guards. And I know she took time, didn't she, Chris, to visit them on training on Salisbury Plain? Uh, she really did. Um, on Salisbury Plain last winter, uh, it was snowing. The wind was going sideways. It was well below zero. But she spent several hours visiting an exercise, looking at the training that the troops were conducting, taking part herself, chatting to as many people as she could. Um, and it was a really fantastic opening statement for her about her involvement and how she wanted to take an interest in everything that we did. And the king, we will be able to see this more clearly but he is wearing the uniform of the Irish Guards. Absolutely. You can see the shamrock on the collar, the buttons in groups of fours. Um, the first time he's worn the uniform as our Colonel-in-Chief. And so a really great moment for all Irish Guardsmen uh, to see the King ride onto Horse Guards in Irish Guards uniform this morning. And the Queen, who has been Colonel of the Grenadier Guards since December 2022, is wearing a Grenadier Guards military brooch. Now the senior coachman will shortly salute the colour with his whip. There it is, as the carriage passes the colour party on the parade ground. And the parade begins sharply at 11 o'clock. The Royal Colonels also saluting the colour, which will be trooped through the ranks a little later. And the Princess of Wales and Prince George and Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis will watch from the window of the Major General's office. The King's Birthday Parade of 2024 is about to begin. The King, the Colonels of the Regiments and senior officers are inspecting the line of guards and they do expect, Chris, the highest possible standards. Uh, they absolutely do. This is no formality. The King, as you said, has done this a number of times. Uh, and so he'll be looking very closely at those on parade. But those on parade, it's a very close personal moment. The King comes very close to you. So for them, it's an important moment as well. But for him, an experienced eye checking on the turnout, checking on the drill and a fantastic moment for everybody on parade there. The music this year is full of Irish inflections, as is the case with this piece of Silk and Gold. It's newly composed by Captain Peter Bryden, Director of Music of the Irish Guards. And it depicts the new colours of Number 9 Company, presented just days ago by His Majesty the King, with their silken fabric and golden thread.
change in tempo for Welcome to Ireland, music arranged by a former director of music of the Band of the Irish Guards, Major Phil Shannon. His Majesty now passes the sovereign standard of the lifeguards carried by Squadron Corporal Major Izireli Wazali. The standard was presented by the King to the regiment just before the coronation. And the procession now going past the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery the saluting battery of His Majesty's household troops. They are commanded by Major John Bailiff. And the King will salute the lead gun, which constitutes the regimental colour. And then we see the unmistakable figure of the Major General commanding the household division, James Bowder, riding Jumping Jack, resplendent in swan feathers, he commissioned into the Grenadier Guards in 1996 and took command in his current role at the end of last year. And he shared his thoughts with us ahead of his first birthday parade. It's certainly my first birthday parade in the role. Uh, and unsurprisingly, like so many of the participants, I'm extraordinarily excited. I'm incredibly proud of our soldiers on parade, and I think what they prove to me daily is quite how extraordinary they are. Over a seven-week period, we've turned combat soldiers into ceremonial soldiers capable of delivering a parade that is best in class globally. Now, let's take a look at the colour and those charged with guarding it in advance of the ceremony today. The two sentries of the colour party, Guardsman Vanati Nakwaki and Guardsman Lee, flank the colour sergeant Chris Enright, whose first birthday parade was 20 years ago. And just a word on the significance of the colour and indeed what today's ceremony is, is all about. Well, the colour is the consecrated symbol of the regiment. It represents the spirit of the regiment, those who have gone before us, those who have been killed in action, their actions and achievements. And they are literally embroidered onto the colour with our battle honours. The parade gets underway in age-old fashion now, with the march, Les Huguenots. Stand and fight by the center. So, march.
There we see the signal for the mass bands to countermarch, given by the raised trombone of Colour Sergeant Andrew Mercer, taking part in his 22nd birthday parade. senior drum major there giving the command for quick march for the massed bands and Major Gareth Chambers of the Irish Guards taking part in his final birthday parade. This senior drum major ordering the change of pace and a musical transition from old to new with a piece composed specifically for this year's quick troop. It's called the Ballyragget. There, the lone drummer breaks away. Drummer David McDowell marching to a position to the right of the escort. He joined the Irish Guards on St Patrick's Day ten years ago this year. And Chris, this piece called the Ballyragget. What is the significance of the name? Well, Ballyragget's both a town in Kilkenny, but it's also the name of an Irish Guards tank, which 80 years ago in the Battle of Normandy after D-Day rammed and disabled a German King Tiger tank, earning the driver a military medal and the commander a military cross. Remembered proudly today as part of our heritage, 80 years on from that critical battle. and the Irish Guards join the forces of the massed bands.
The drummer plays eight bars of a field signal called the drummer's call, recalling an age when communication on the battlefield relied upon the drums. And the orderly, guardsman Sozi, marches forward to take the pace stick from Regimental Sergeant Major Peter Swain. He can then draw his sword, ready to protect the colour, and he's the only warrant officer on parade to draw a sword. The subaltern of the escort, Lieutenant Monty Badger, gives the order for the escort to take up their dressing in close order. So as you see a tighter formation for the march forward to collect the colour. And the eyes front there, perfectly achieved without a word of command. Escort steps off to the rousing march of the British Grenadiers. Escort march forward and they will halt 16 paces from the colour party, ready for the collection of the colour. The mass bands turn about to face the colour party and the senior director of music takes up a new position close to the front. Regimental Sergeant Major Peter Swain now prepares to take possession of the colour. Protecting it with his sword. And ready to hand it over safely. And he will now hand it to the ensign, Lieutenant Harry Winterbottom, who will troop the colour through the ranks.
marching on from the Major General's office. Prince Louis, Princess Charlotte, Prince George, and Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales. The ensign and the regimental sergeant major resume their positions within the escort and the escort for the colour, having been taken possession, has now become the escort to the colour. We're approaching the symbolic heart of today's ceremony. Absolutely. Uh, we're now approaching the moment from which the ceremony takes its name. Uh, and having been in the escort myself back in 1996, I know this will be one of the points of the parade that will really matter most to everybody in the escort to troop the colour in front of their fellow guardsmen. And as the escort advances in slow time, the bands now play Escort to the Colour, the traditional stepping off music for this part of the parade for nearly 50 years. And if we watch carefully, this is called the spin wheel. The massed bands executing the military equivalent of a, a three-point turn and something of a, a move of mystery. It's absolutely a move of mystery. Uh, it's part of the parade that's confusing to anybody who isn't a musician. Indeed, to anybody who hasn't served in the bands, because the only way to understand the spin wheel is actually to do it. Because there's no written instruction, and how to do it is passed on by word of mouth, one generation to the next. One thing that's always the same, though, they always end up in the right place. God! Freedom! Earth! Music changes to the majestic Grenadiers' slow march as the escort prepares to treat the colour through the ranks. significant moment for Ensign, for the Ensign, um, Lieutenant Harry Winterbottom, and he spoke to us about being accorded the honour of trooping his regiment's colour. Absolutely delighted to be Ensign on this year's King's Birthday Parade. We've been preparing really hard for it, several months now of training. On the day itself, I'm going to be thinking about a lot, the symbolic and physical weight. We carry a lot of history, specifically in the colour. It's got all our battle honours, and in it also we remember all those who've fallen. I think no doubt I'll be feeling the weight of that as I march the colour past His Majesty the King. My friends and family are really excited for me. They know that this is a job that I really love doing. I think they will also appreciate the irony that growing up I would always avoid the limelight, and here I am on perhaps the biggest military parade of the year. Now, he's very conscious of everything the colour represents and, indeed, its history. The colours were last carried into battle in 1881, but nearly 150 years later, still hugely significant. Very significant. Uh, colours were the rallying point in the confusion of battle, and the act of showing or trooping the colour was to show each man what their colour looked like. The tradition's continued ever since, and the colour has developed into the hugely respected symbol that it is today. It's also an enduring link to the King, as our Colonel-in-Chief, who presents our colours personally, as he did on Monday at Windsor Castle.
Officers! Tank bound! Quick, bound! The command given by the field officer for the officers to take post. And the colour will move to the rear of the escort. Numbers one to five guards will retire. About turn. Drums now perform the girl I left behind me. has been trooped through the ranks. The guards are forming up for the march past and all six guards will march past the king in slow and quick time. And the mass band's currently playing a new neutral slow march written especially for this year's parade by Sergeant Adam Barris. It's called Earl Alexander of Tunis. So, Chris, tell me about the man behind the title. Well, the march is a tribute to the most famous and successful Irish Guardsman in our history. Harold Alexander was commissioned into the regiment in 1911. He fought through both the First and Second World Wars, was decorated for bravery several times, and finished his service as a field marshal. He was the Irish Guards Colonel between 1946 and his death in 1969, a hugely respected figure, and it's great to remember him on parade today with this march. This is the first time that the Irish Guards have trooped their colour in front of a king in more than 70 years. And it's number nine company Irish Guards who are providing the escort and who will lead the foot guards past His Majesty the King. And they're a relatively new addition to the Irish Guards. They are. They've formed very recently. For over 30 years, the Grenadier, Coldstream and Scots Guards had their own public duties companies. Uh, in 2022, the Irish Guards joined their number by forming their own company, Number 9 Company. But although the company may be new, there's absolutely no sign of that showing through, stepping off extremely smartly in slow time. see there the field officer and brigade waiting, also the commanding officer of the London Central Garrison, Lieutenant Colonel James Colby on the grey mare Onyx, and behind him the major of the parade, Major Spencer Jones, a third generation guardsman. Both his grandfathers and his father served in the guards. He's riding George. Slow march, let Aaron remember. And the 
ensign lowers and raises the colour, the flourish and the recover, as they're known. You can see those battle honours there, so carefully embroidered onto the colour. as easy as it looks. Absolutely not. And that's incredibly hard work carrying the colour. Uh, Harry Winterbottom will have trained hard to avoid cramp at that moment. And next to march past the King, Nijmegen Company Grenadier Guards and the Colonel of the Grenadier Guards, Her Majesty the Queen. F Company Scots Guards provide number three guard. And they are led by Major Jamie Drummond Murray, a fifth generation Scots Guard officer. And their new Colonel of the Regiment is the Duke of Edinburgh, on the left there. And he took over earlier this year from the Duke of Kent, who had served in the role for 50 years. Music turns to Men of Harlech, which means it is, of course, the Welsh Guards who form both numbers four and five guard. And their colonel, the Prince of Wales, looks on. And he succeeded his father on becoming Prince of Wales. He did a very proud moment for him in a custom that the Prince of Wales is Colonel of the Welsh Guards going back to 1919. And number six guard completes the march past in slow time, comprised of number seven company Coldstream Guards, and they are marching to their regimental slow march, Figaro. And the adjutant of the parade, Captain Rory Crichton Stewart brings up the rear, riding in his first birthday parade. He is the 13th generation of his family to commission into the Scots Guards. <laughs> Prince Louis. <laughs> Stealing the show as ever. Officer in, in brigade waiting, Lieutenant Colonel James Colby, riding out to salute the king. Of the 7,000 people in the stands watching on, many of them are friends and family members, and Ransi Chinyanganya has been speaking to some of them. Now, there's family support, and then there are the Tates, many of whom have come all the way from Northern Ireland. All are here to support Corporal Elliot Tate. I'm delighted to be joined by Mum Lisa. Lisa, you must be so proud. Yes, today is a very proud day for me and my family. To be here in person means the world for us. Um, Elliot's always wanted to be a guardsman, um, so being here today to watch him achieve his dream, it just means everything. And as a mum, are you just a teensy weensy bit nervous? Uh, maybe a little bit nervous, but more excited, more excitement today to and watch the proceedings. Thank you very much. And talking about excitement, somebody who'll be marrying him in the not too distant future. Gail, how much does it mean to you to be here to watch your fiancé do his thing? It's very special. It really is. Um, Elliot passed out during COVID, so unfortunately we didn't get to see that happen. Um, so every event that's led up to now has just been so special. Um, we're so proud, um, but no one will be as more proud today than Elliot. And Dale, how often do you get to see him at work? Not very often. I can't just pop down, so it's quite difficult. So this makes it even more special. And how long till the wedding, by the way? One more year. One more year to go. You've chosen very, very well. Good luck for the wedding and good luck, Elliot. Thank you. Guards have reformed 
and here they go in quick march. So change in pace. Is there an exact pace actually to a quick there is, march? There um, is. Uh, slow marching is 65 paces to the minute, and this quick march is 116 to the minute. And this is a real challenge. Um, it's harder physical work in quick time, but it's also more, dif more difficult because everything happens faster. So it's more of a challenge to keep dressing, keep your spacing when everything around you is happening at a much quicker tempo. And this neutral quick march is called Aramanche and it's named for the area of Normandy of the same name that bore witness to the D-Day landings. And we marked the 80th anniversary of D-Day last week. And there in the crowd, D-Day Royal Navy veteran, 98-year-old George Chandler from Burgess Hill. In 1944, he was a gunner on a British motor torpedo boat, leaving from New Haven on the afternoon of D-Day to provide cover for American troops heading to Omaha and Utah beaches. And the composer, actually, of Aramanche, Albert Kelly, landed in Normandy on D-Day. He was wounded but survived, and he wrote this march a few years later. And actually, thinking of the 80th commemorations of D-Day, General Eldon Miller the man in overall charge of that. And so many commemorated on the D-Day anniversary were desperately young, as are many on parade today. Absolutely. Uh, the Bearskins hide um, some extremely young people aged 18 and 19 years of age, many of them on their first trip in the colour. And so it's really it's a testament to their training, their commitment and skill, that they're individually striving for excellence and so to contributing to this amazing teamwork. Now, as the regiments parade past the king in quick time, we will be treated to a succession of quick marches, including one of your favourites. We will. Every guardsman knows their tune, their regimental march uh, well. Makes you march a little bit taller with a little bit more swagger. The number nine company will march past the king to the Irish Guards' quick march, St Patrick's Day, which is one of my personal favourites. the Irish Guards Regimental Quick March, St Patrick's Day. Nijmegen Company Grenadier Guards march past two the British Grenadiers. signifies the turn of F Company Scots Guards. <laughs> so you enjoying boogieing along to that? Number four and number five guards are provided by the 1st Battalion Welsh Guards, and they march to their quick march, the Rising of the Lark. Seven Company, Coldstream Guards bring up the rear. Their quick march is Milanolo. That's a really successful performance by the senior drum major who's got quite a job to get in five regimental marches as each guard passes in front of the saluting base. Waiting, saluting there, His Majesty the King with two movements of the sword. And he said before that onyx can be a little jiggy. 
she used to be a, a trumpeter's horse, so she does respond to music. Field officer. Is thrilled and proud to hold this role today. Let's hear from James Colby. This year, as Field Officer in Brigade Waiting, I have the privilege of commanding the parade and all the troops on it. Um, it's, a, it's an enormous privilege, one I never thought I would be doing. Uh, I count myself very lucky, uh, not just to be on parade, but also to be on parade with my own soldiers. To see the product of all the hard work and the hours of marching around the square that the soldiers have done is incredible. For me, personally, this is a bucket list item. A little boy from Suffolk who used to watch this on TV, I never thought I'd be in this position, but I am. And to be able to deliver this parade to His Majesty, it fills me with huge pride. We've done the hard work, we've put in the hours, and it'll be a magnificent parade. That's very touching that James Colby says this is a bucket list moment. And as many are on parade today, he is very much a representative of those who combine it with frontline service, and that dual role. Absolutely, I mean, with this hugely impressive site laid out in front of us, it's easy to forget that each and every guardsman here is a highly trained combat soldier. They've deployed worldwide um, to the Middle East, to Eastern Europe, um, all around the world, the Irish Guards alone, to nine countries in Africa in the last year. Um, so it's important to realize that these are very, very special and trained people. And training, indeed, of the Ukrainian troops. Yes, the Irish Guards spent a long time uh, in the last year training thousands of Ukrainian troops on Salisbury Plain, and His Majesty the King came to visit them, uh, which was very great. This wonderful music, Brian Baru's march, as the massed bands and drums move to the south side of the parade to create space for the mounted band. And it must be such a moment. as a proud Irish Guard to hear this, Chris. Uh, it's incredible. Brian Baru named after the Irish Guard's first regimental mascot. Uh, but the pipes are a really special part of the battalion. Only the Irish and Scots Guards have them. And a quick word about the uh, pipers and drummers. Um, these remarkable young men, trained infantry soldiers, but to learn the pipes also takes many months and then constant practice. So these are really special people, um, sounding absolutely brilliant as they march away from the saluting base. And here come the mounted troops, the household cavalry, and the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. The band of the Household Cavalry, though, moving on to Horse Guards first, led by the Director of Music, Major Craig Bywater, who's riding Passchendaele, and accompanied by the glorious sight of Apollo and Juno, the two drum horses, ridden by Corporal of Horse Richard Brown and Lance Corporal of Horse James Ballantyne. I should say officially they are Major Apollo and Major Juno because the drum horses carry that title. And the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. The thundering noise as they come onto the parade ground, not just of the horses but also of the guns. We've 
got 76 horses pulling six guns on behalf of the King's Troop on Horse Artillery today. It's the saluting battery of His Majesty's household troops comprising of 180 personnel, 120 military working horses. They're led by their commanding officer, Major John Baylor. Riding Marmaduke Mully Grubs. They've got some interesting names, the King Street horses. Known as Basil in the stables. The King Street Raw's Artillery! Royal Salute! Eyes! Right! They were given the name the King's Troop by the King's grandfather, King George VI, in 1946, and the late Queen requested they keep that name in memory of her father. Later on, we will hear them firing the Royal Salute from Green Park, a 41-gun salute to mark the King's official birthday. And the King salutes the gun, which is the colour of the King's Troop. They are 13-pounder quick-fire field guns. They're the only guns of their type still in existence. And those on parade today all entered service in 1904 and saw service in the First World War. They all also saw active service in the Second World War as anti-aircraft guns. Now, following the King's Troop, the two regiments of the Household Cavalry Mounted Regiment, the Lifeguards, and behind them, the Blues and Royals. So this year it is the lifeguards who have the honour of riding in front as first and second divisions of the Sovereign's Escort. standard of the lifeguards lowered there by standard bearer Corporal Major Izirelli Wasali. Both the King and Queen acknowledging the salute. And it would have taken so many days and weeks, you know, think of way, way more than hours to make sure that every part of what you see on parade today is gleaming and perfectly presented. Each pair of boots alone can take about 20 hours to prepare. And they're jack boots, so very, very stiff, good for protection, but not so easy to ride in. The Princess Royal there, the Colonel of the Blues and Royals, as they pass by. And Princess Anne riding not just as Colonel of the Regiment, but also as Gold Stick in Waiting. Absolutely, being Colonel of Blues Royals today, Gold Stick in Waiting, an appointment which goes back to Tudor times with the responsibility for the personal safety of the monarch. If you like, it's the close protection officer of a few hundred years ago, and at the back, the farriers with their gleaming axes bring up the rear of the Sovereign's escort. Field officers, trumpeter, trooper Beatty, sounding the trot past. The trumpeter traditionally rode next to the commanding officer, always on a grey horse who could be seen much more easily on the battlefield amongst all the black horses. And he will have to gallop to slot back into place near the front. goes he's gonna to have to sweep right round the outside come past them all join in at the front there we go as everybody else moves into sitting trucks and is he gonna make it Well done, Trooper Beatty. 
So just as we saw the foot guards march past in slow and quick time, so do the mounted troops. And as the trot pass commences, it is once again the turn of King's Troop to the music of the regimental trot pass to both the Household Cavalry and the King's Troop, the keel row. It's a traditional Tyneside melody. of the guns and gun and limber pulled by three pairs of horses. Now here we have the lifeguards. And at the trot past, the standard will remain at the carry. Could be argued, Chris, that obviously it is difficult on parade for everybody. It is a tough job, but for the mounted regiments, it is, does seem to me particularly challenging. It's really hard riding these magnificent horses. is difficult. It's hard work, even in normal riding clothes. But wearing the cuirasses, the jack boots, having the helmets bal balancing on the middle of your temple takes real skill. So incredibly skillful work here by the troopers and officers of the Household Cavalry. some very strong family ties and operational experience in the Sovereign's escort. There are some remarkable people. Major Tom Stewart, uh, the captain of the escort, followed his father into the lifeguards. Behind him, Captain Harry Stone of the Blues, and behind him, Lieutenant Dima Firks, who also followed his father into the lifeguards. And remarkably, both of them have completed the Army's arduous pre-parachute selection company, P Company. Well, that's really a statement about the modern household cavalry, who, in addition to their ceremonial duties, are also at the cutting edge of the Army's armoured reconnaissance capability. Director of Music Major Craig Bywater leads the band of the household cavalry, and the kettle drummers cross their sticks as a symbol of respect that is their customary salute to the king. And these gorgeous drum horses. Apollo, who is 10 years old for the Blues and Royals. And Juno, his sister, for the lifeguards. And she was officially named last year by the Queen, by Queen Camilla, in the gardens of Clarence House. And both of them, real gentle giants, fantastic personalities, very kind, really popular as well with the public and with, with everybody, actually. Now the director of music turning there, signalling that he's handing back control of the parade to the field officer for the final birthday Royal salute to the king here on Royal Horse Guards.
the guards dress, this time all the guards in one long line. And precision moves again, achieved without words of command. Communication between the individuals, telepathic. Now the field officer, James Colby, trotting forward on Onyx to ask His Majesty's permission to march off to Buckingham Palace. And more ceremony still to come there once the regiments of foot guards have escorted His Majesty King back down the Mall. Your Majesty's guards are ready to march off, sir. Moving across the parade ground, Garrison Sergeant Major Andrew Stokes, known as Vern. He's one of the most senior warrant officers in the British Army. He's the man in charge of delivering on the ground everything you see today. Guards! And Guards! he served alongside the field officer, James Colby, Guards! in Iraq. And the guards will accompany the royal procession back to Buckingham Palace. As ever, there will be some rousing music and a reminder that, weather allowing, we expect the fly-past and the balcony appearance of members of the royal family. Now there we see the senior drum major, Gareth Chambers, leading the massed bands of the household division. He's a hugely impressive and experienced figure, the senior drum major. Um, if the massed bands are a car, he's the driver. And he's held his post through some of the most significant state ceremonial events in a generation. Trusted to get it right on even the most complicated parade. On his last birthday parade today as the senior drum major, and proudly there wearing the medal of a member of the Royal Victorian Order, presented by the King for his contribution over the last few years. As the procession continues down the mall, I'm delighted to say that joining myself and Major General Sir Christopher Geeker is none other than author and broadcaster Giles Brandreth. And I don't know, Giles, whether you've seen Trooping the Colour at such close quarters before. Never before at such close quarters. It is truly wonderful. And, of course, the rain here is reminding us that this is a uniquely British occasion. I mean, if, if like me, you're into history and heritage, pageantry, precision, colour, music, majesty, and the military men and women doing their thing better than anyone else in the world, this is your kind of day. As the lead carriages reach the Queen Victoria Memorial, and you can see the Princess of Wales and Princess Charlotte trying desperately to clean that fog off the glass so they can see and so the public can see them. This has always been a, a family day. The royal family, though the idea of the family firm only became popular in the 1940s as a phrase, this goes back a long way. Uh, Queen Victoria, I think, made her first appearance on this famous balcony back in 1851. I think that's when royal appearances on the balcony began. So being seen, I think it was actually Queen Victoria. It's often attributed to Elizabeth II, but I think it was Queen Victoria who first said, I have to be seen to be believed. So being visible is part and parcel of being the sovereign. You see the royal colonels there, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Princess Royal, riding immediately behind the carriage. But I think very wise of His Majesty the King to not ride this year. 
he, he rode incredibly well last year on a new horse um, but uh, going into the carriage this year. But behind him, the Royal Colonels on uh, some very steady horses. Um, and as you said, Claire, the Princess Royal, an extremely experienced horsewoman. Chris will confirm this. One of the things that he's inherited the king from Elizabeth II is a keen eye for detail. And he'll have been looking at the troops with particular care, won't he? Uh, absolutely. And when you get back to the uh, quadrangle of Buckingham Palace and get off your horse, uh, James Coby will, will go and see him, and the king will tell him what he thought. Um, and uh, he'll point out a few things. Um, but generally, uh, it's a congratulation for an extremely professional performance, uh, which I think we can all reflect on as the guards march back to Buckingham Palace behind the band. Majesty the King departs the parade, heads inside Buckingham Palace, ready for the balcony appearance and further tributes from the armed forces to mark his official birthday. We've got the RAF fly past and the annual birthday gun salute from the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. Now the crowds making their way down the mall. And the famous sight of the Met Police doing a fantastic job marshalling. Everyone's keen to secure a spot for a sight of the famous balcony appearance of the King and the Queen and the Prince of Wales, the Princess of Wales, their children. We still have the gun salute from the King's Troop and the RAF fly past to come. The crowds, as you can see, flooding their way down. That is, a, it's an amazing sight, that. It really is. Can you imagine anything more British than this? Just look at the brothers. This says, this says it all. The King's Troop are now in position, waiting to fire the first gun of the 41-gun Royal Salute. Number one! Fire! Number two! Fire! Number three! And that really is a magnificent sight of the clouds having cleared. You can hear the 41 gun salute still continuing a few more rounds to go of that. And very shortly we will see the royal family appear on the balcony. And as well as the pageantry giles of the parade itself and the connection between the troops and the king, it is this family image that we will see very shortly on the balcony that is so important and, and indelible, really, in our minds. This is an iconic moment. It's been going on, this kind of thing, since 1851, at the time of the Great Exhibition, masterminded by Prince Albert, consort to Queen Victoria. That's when all this really began in this part of the world. The 41-gun salute has come to an end, and very shortly we will see 34 aircraft from the RAF taking part in the fly-past. Here come the King and the Queen and the other members of the royal family onto the balcony so they can raise their eyes to the skies. Ten of the 15 squadrons represented were involved in D-Day, and in Wave 1 we have three Chinook helicopters from Number 7 Squadron, a squadron based at RAF Odium in Hampshire, celebrating its 110th anniversary this year. And you can really feel the noise from those helicopters goes right through you. Impressive way to start the fly past. And real appreciation both from the Prince of Wales and from the King into what it takes to be a pilot. Following the Chinooks, we have three typhoons from number 29 squadron from RAF Coningsby in Lincolnshire. Now, this wave would have been a Lancaster, a Spitfire, and a Hurricane from the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, but the tragic death of squadron leader Mark Long in a Spitfire crash just a few weeks ago means there is understandably a change but all three Typhoon pilots flying were close friends and colleagues of squadron leader Long 
and the formation is using the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight radio call sign of Memorial Flight in his honour. Next, we have three RAF training aircraft, a Fenham T-1 from RAF Cranwell and two Texan T-1s from RAF Valley. And here, the largest aircraft in the flypast today, the C-17 Globemaster from 99 Squadron, based at RAF Bryce Norton. And that's been providing support to Ukraine and NATO's missions in Eastern Europe, and as well as delivering aid to the Middle East. Now, the second wave of transport aircraft, the Voyager, a modified civilian Airbus A330-200 passenger aircraft and an A400M Atlas. Now, the sixth wave of the flypast consists of a Poseidon MRA-1 from RAF Lossiemouth with a Typhoon FGR-4 from RAF Coningsby on each wing. On board the Poseidon is Wing Commander Andy Shaw, the mission commander for all of the aircraft in the flypast today. Flying behind the Poseidon and Typhoons is the rivet joint from RAF Waddington with another two Typhoons from RAF Coningsby. And there's a lot of experience on the balcony amongst members of the royal family in terms of, of flying, the King, the Prince of Wales as well, and I think interest from the younger members too. And the King's grandfather, King George VI, also served with the RAF and was the first member of the British Royal Family to be certified as a fully qualified pilot. Next, we have a formation of three Hawk T2s from RAF Valley in Wales. The Hawk used for flying training and bringing personnel up to fast jet operational standards. Prince of Wales saw Flight Lieutenant Wales, as he was known in the RAF, join Sea Flight 22 Squadron at RAF Valley in Anglesey. In September 2010, he was a search and rescue pilot, spent three years doing that. Flying behind the Hawks is a formation of four F-35B Lightning Jets from the Dambuster Squadron, based at RAF Marham in Norfolk. Their commanding officer, Wing Commander Stu Campbell, has served in the RAF for 21 years. And now, providing the colourful finale to the flypast is the RAF aerobatic team, the Red Arrows. It's a big year for them celebrating their 60th display season in 2024. And since their formation, they've given almost 5,000 displays in 57 countries. They're led by Red One Squadron Leader John Bond, a former frontline Typhoon pilot. This is John's first year as the team leader, as that red, white and blue makes its way through the blue sky and over Buckingham Palace. recognition from those on the balcony to the fans below who having braved the weather are now treated with summer sunshine
as the royal party make their way back inside. Chris, your final thoughts on today's? I think it's been outstanding. A lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, and they've delivered something really special. And Giles? Well, extraordinary, actually, to see this new royal family, three generations on parade, something that's been happening for so many hundreds of years. And what an impressive and magnificent celebration to mark the official birthday of King Charles III. With huge respect and thanks to all those who have taken part in Trooping the Colour for 2024. From all of us here at the BBC, we bid you farewell. <laughs>